is that really in the Bible? You live in a world where everyone has an opinion about the Bible. Of what values are your beliefs if they are not clearly found in the pages of your Bible? The question we must ask is, are your opinions and beliefs really found in the Bible? Well, hello, I'm David Freeman with Is That Really in the Bible? In Matthew 6 and verse 10, Jesus told us how to pray. He said, when you pray, say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Which really, when you think about it, it's, a, it's an acknowledgement of two things. And it's easy to overlook this. Number one, this is not God's world. Because we're, we're asking for God's kingdom to come. Number two, God's will is not being done here because we're asking for God's will to be done on this earth as it is up in heaven. Now, so we're praying for a time when it will be God's world and when God's will will be done. That's what we're praying for. Now, I heard about a story of Phil Robertson on Duck Dynasty. I didn't actually get to see this program, but it was an episode where there, were, there was this gay guy taking pictures of Phil, his wife, and his dog. And the guy was obviously gay by his mannerism and all that, and the way he talked, you know, the whisk of the lips or whatever. Anyway, um, he, he would say, now, Mr. Robinson, is, is, is this okay? We're going to take a picture right here of you, your dog, your wife, and, and now we're going to do it over here, and now you sit right here, and we're going to do this, and we're going to take a picture right here. Now, Mr. Robinson, is this okay? How? And Phil said, he said, he said, I don't know. He said, it's your, it's your world. I'm just trying to live in it. Now, I, I, I love that, you know, it, it really, that statement reveals the Christian dilemma. And that is, you know, hey, it's your world. It's not my world. It's not God's world. It's not the Christian's world. It's your world. I'm just trying to live in it. The world of gay marriage, the world of gender confusion. Am I a man or am I a woman? The world of aborted potential children. Hey, it's your world. I'm just trying to live in it. The Christian knows there is a better way. The Christian knows that the sinner's way will never work. The Christian knows that it's not a Christian world. He's just trying to live in it. The world of single moms trying to rear their children. Now, I know that if that fits you, that, if that describes you, I'm not putting you down. I'm just saying that's not the way God intended it to be. Uh, the world of incest and child abuse, the world of injustice, the world of racism, the world of terrorism, the world of some nut up on a roof killing people who are at a concert. Hey, it's your world. I'm just trying to live in it. Uh, this is the Christian dilemma. You can't make it right, is what I'm saying. You can't solve the problems. I don't care how many churches you get. I don't care if you increased it from 450,000 churches in America to 10 million churches in America. It's not going to change the world. It's not going to make your world a godly society. You can't make it right. You can't solve the problem. Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 15 says, That which is crooked cannot be made straight. Let me tell you something. We're crooked. We're a crooked nation. We're a crooked and perverse nation. And you're not going to make it right. You're not going to make it right. Philippians 2 and verse 15 says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked, and here this is the descript, this fits us to a T, a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. This is the Christian dilemma that we're faced with. We can't make it right. It's not easy to watch your world rot and die. The world of pornography. Hey, it's your world. I'm just trying to live in it. You know, if you're a parent and you have a 12-year-old son, let me ask you a question. What's the chance of that boy never coming across an internet porn site? What's the chance? Let me tell you the chance. Zero. Absolutely zero. I was reading an article just recently about porn-induced ED. These are erectile dysfunction. These are guys in their 20s who now have erectile dysfunction. And it works like this. They can get an erection watching porn, but they can't get an erection in a real relationship with a woman. Can't, you know. 
porn indu- it's called porn-induced ED. And what happens is they say the receptors in the brain are reprogrammed so that the stimuli of pornography excites the man, but a real relationship with a woman does not. Now, you, you think about this. You think about it. You know, the Bible says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. When healthy sexuality is destroyed, you've brought into the enemy's lie. Porn, pornography destroys healthy sexuality. It really does. Now, in the real Lord's Prayer, in John 17, the personal prayer that Jesus said before his death, it says this in John 17 and verse 14. This is what Jesus is telling his disciples. Now, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Uh, a lot of you claim to be, but we're going to give you a test here to see if you really are. He said, Jesus said, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Notice, the world hates you. And the reason the world hates you, if you're a real disciple, is because you're not a part of it, don't you know? John 17 and verse 15. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. And thank God for that. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, what does it mean to to not be of this world? Well, let me give you three illustrations here of what it means not to be of this world. Number one, not of this world's educational system. You know, when our daughter was growing up, we made the decision to homeschool our daughter. And the public school wanted to know our intent for homeschooling. And I sent them a nice little letter that said, look, sending my daughter to a public school would be like taking her to a zoo every day and throwing her in a cage full of monkeys. And, you can, and, and saying, now, you can, daughter, you can watch these monkeys, you can look at these monkeys, but don't you do what these monkeys are doing. That was my explanation as to why I wanted to homeschool. I didn't want her acting like wild monkeys. All right. Now, not of this world's religious system. Yeah, that's something else you got to come out of, this world's relig- religious system. you got to come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins. This mystery religion, this Babylonian religion that really has nothing to do with the will of God at all, it's all traditions and made up of man. But listen, when God called me, he did not call me to a conviction of Sunday keeping. He didn't. He, he called me to a conviction of the Sabbath day the seventh day of the week. When God called me, he did not call me into a conviction of, well, I just need to put Christ back into Christmas. And if we can just really turn Christmas into all about Jesus, everything will be okay. No, he didn't give me that conviction. He gave me a conviction of God's annual holy days. These are the feasts of the Lord's. Uh, When God called me, he did not give me a conviction of heavenly retirement, that I would retire in heaven for all eternity. You know, there's a cabin in the sky, so be careful when you step out the door. He didn't give me a conviction of that. And he did not give me, when God called me, he did not give me a conviction, a superficial conviction uh, of sin. All you got to do is just raise your hand. Yeah, I invite Jesus into my heart, whatever that means, and that's it. Okay, you're saved. We'll write you down as saved. We've saved a thousand souls today or whatever. He didn't give me a superficial conviction of sin. He gave me a real conviction of sin and realized, I realized that I was about to self-destruct. That's what God did for me. Number three, not of this world's political system either. Now, I vote. You know, I believe you should vote, but I don't have faith in man. I don't for one second that any man, I don't care whether it's Democrat or Republican, no man can solve the world's problems. It's not going to happen. Jesus never even hinted to the concept that, well, if you just... You know, you get the churches in to get involved and you get uh, churches involved and everything and then uh, you vote the right guy in the White House and you can have a utopian government on earth. Jesus never, ever promised that. He said, when you pray, say, God, I want your kingdom to come to this earth and I want your will to be done on this earth as it's being done in heaven. That's what, that's what your Bible says. John 15 and verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. The world would love you if you're really a part of it. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now I want to tell you something. The world loves its own. Yes, the world loves its own. 
Go to any party, go to any concert, go to a bar, uh, listen to the meaningless conversation, listen, listen to the prurient interests, look at the decency, decency uh, of people in general. You know, just go to Walmart. If you want to see the direction this nation is going, go to Walmart. Um, it's pathetic. It really is. Just look at the people in Walmart. I mean, just look at the people. Look at the rebellious children. Look at the, look at the lack of respect. Look at the quality of the, uh, the people, you know. Just, just, you know, just look, look at Walmart, you know. I went to Walmart in Roanoke, and I came out, and I told my wife, I said, I'm depressed. I'm thinking about killing myself. I said, why? I said, I just, look at, it's Walmart. That's the direction that we're going, you know. You had people in there with, you know, riding these big, these, these carts, young people riding carts around and, and, you know, people with rear ends as big, big as the side of a barn and it's, it's unreal. I mean, I it just, it's like, this is where we're going as a nation. This is where we're going. The world loves its own. And if you're not a part of the, you know, the, the vulgarity, the meaningless conversation, the prurient interests, the world will, will disown you. It will have nothing to do with you if you're not a part of it. You know, misery loves company. Did you know the world will disown you if you're not a misery lover? That in order to be a part of the world, you need to be a misery lover to fit in. Yeah, I'm telling you the truth. You know, I, I've met too many people who are misery lovers and, and wanted, you, wanted me to be a part of their misery, woe is me you know, attitude. I got a little poem here I'm going to tell you. Because I found this true with dysfunctional people, you know. Uh, I found that dysfunctional people love to tell their story of confusion and mayhem, you know. Stories like, well, the dog got ran over, Ricky got another DUI, uh, Peter got a girl knocked up and refuses to pay child support, and the reason the police are always giving him a hard time is because he's not, you know, that's the reason the police are always giving him a hard time. It has nothing to do with the fact that he won't pay child support, but they're always, the police are always after my boy, my son, whatever. I love to tell my story of dysfunction, confusion, and mayhem. Roxy swallowed gasoline. I'm going back to jail. But at least they give you three hots in a cot and a vinegar bath is not so bad after all. My girlfriend has herpes and so do I. My father-in-law kicked me out of the house. We got into a fight and he broke my nose. But I love to tell you my story because you listen so attentively. If I were ashamed of myself, I wouldn't tell you my story. But because you listen so attentively, it justifies my actions. And besides, there's probably not a lot of difference between you and me. You ever met people like that? They love to tell you their raunchy, dysfunctional, nutty, confused lifestyle. These people drive me crazy. And sometimes you just got to say, look, your dysfunctional, screwed up life, that's your world. I'm just trying to live it, you know. I'm just trying to live it. Reluctantly, we have to live, you know, and that's the bad part. Sometimes these people are your very neighbors that you got to live beside up. Or reluctantly, you have befriended me. This, 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 this dysfunctional person has befriended you. Now, how people of the world live their lives. 1 John 2 and verse 15 it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is, it, is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. Yeah, I hate to inform you, but it's about doing the will of God. And I'm sorry, you're just not going to hear that in church very much. You know, often you hear God's will explained away. You know, grace plus nothing. There's nothing you must do. Uh, and you, you wonder, who are you going to believe? You're going to believe your Bible or you're going to believe what your preacher is telling you? That there's nothing you must do and it's, it, it, God really doesn't have a will. But this talks about doing the will of God, that it's critical to understand what his will is. Now, I want you to think about something. I want to ask you a question. How close are we to the return of Jesus Christ to this earth, to set up his kingdom on this earth? 
You know, God is on a time schedule. God has allotted mankind 6,000 years to do his own thing, to live by the law that says if it feels good, I'm going to do it. Man governing man, man trying to figure out what will work, man trying to get the right president in the White House. God, has, God is on a time schedule, and he's allotted mankind 6,000 years. Your, your Bible says a day to God is like a thousand years, or a thousand years is like a day. Six working days God has given us, or 6,000 years. Now, here's the point. Those 6,000 years of man's history on this earth are about up, according to Jewish reckoning, that, th that mankind has basically been on this earth for nearly 6,000 years. And what you are coming to is the seventh day or the Sabbath day or the millennial rest of God's people. That is the return of Jesus Christ to this earth to establish that 1,000 year reign on this earth or the 7,000 years or the seventh day. So we've been on this earth for about 6,000 years and the time is we're right there on the edge, we're right there at the edge at the return of Jesus Christ. Now, I personally believe, and it's just my opinion, but that Donald Trump will be the last American king we will ever have. When I say the last American king, I'm talking about the last American president who was for the ideal of America. That is the freedom, the liberty that we have, the Constitution that we have, the Second Amendment that we have, that he will be the last American president that represents those things, the things that we sort of hold dear to us. After his term, be it four or eight years, you're going to see the elections of socialist presidents being elected. And from there, you're going to be amazed at how quick things can escalate and go downhill. Once we decide to sell out our freedom, you're going to be amazed. And I think things can very quickly escalate to a time when Jesus said, except I return, no flesh would be saved alive. You know, we almost sold our freedom in this last election had Bernie or the Hildebeest gotten elected because they basically represented socialism. So we almost sold our freedom in this last election. That's why I say I think uh, Trump will be the last American president that represents America and, Amer you know, make America great again. He would probably be the last president, American president, that we ever have. And from there, you will see things go downhill very quickly. Um, how important is freedom to God? And a lot of people would say, well, Christ died for our sins, and that's true. But I think a truer statement is that he died for our freedom. In other words, let me explain what that means. God created us a free moral agency, and he wants us to, change, to stay that way. He loves the fact that we have the ability to look at something that is right and look at something that is wrong and to choose between the two, and he will never take that freedom away from you. He died for our freedom so that we could stay free and be free, and to always have the freedom to choose between right and wrong. Now, when we take our freedom and we choose not to sin, that's called building godly character. In other words, we look at something that's right, we look at something that's wrong, and we say, I'm not going to go down that direction. I'm not going in the direction of sin. When you do that, you are building godly character within. So, but if, if you're free to choose not to sin, that also means that you are free to sin. And that's very true. We are free. We can take our freedom and go either direction. Now, as far as Christ dying for our sins, God could have, listen closely, God cr could have created us like robots. He could have programmed us to always do the right thing. And then he would not have to die for our sins. Why? Because we would never sin. Now get this, he could have programmed us like a robot, like a programming device, like we program a computer to always do the right thing and never sin. Therefore, he would not have to die 
for our sins. He could have done it that way. Or he could have created us like the animal kingdom. Cows never sin. They just do what cows do. They do what they do by nature, by instinct. He could have created us like cows. But you see, cows can't, cannot make moral decisions. With the freedom to make moral decisions, God is creating clay beings that will one day, us, clay beings, that will one day be like him in the image and in the likeness of God. Now, if you think this is a far-fetched idea that God is creating beings like himself, that, this will blow your mind, <clears throat> God is reproducing himself through mankind. Yeah, God is reproducing himself through mankind. Now, if you think that's a strange concept, look at 1 John 3 and verse 2. It says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Notice the next verse, verse 3. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. So, if you're a Christian, a real Christian, the question is this. Is this occurring in your life? Are you purifying yourself through the power of God's Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you? Because that's basically what the Holy Spirit does. It creates you into a being where you purify the old man, the old sinful self. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It is a process. But there's a purification process that's going on. And every man that has this hope that we're going to be sons of God, like God. We're going to see God as he is, face to face. Every man that has this hope purifies himself. So how are you doing in that area of purifying yourself? Hopefully you're doing good. It's impossible to do, to do without the Spirit of God, though. Understand that. Okay. Well, let's continue on with this concept of it's about, about the soon coming government kingdom of God on this earth. Hebrews 11 and verse 13. It says, these all died in faith, not having received, received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, they died not having received the promise. What promise? Well, the promise of eternal life, the promise of being in God's kingdom. Right now, they're in the grave. They're sleeping. They're dead. And they're going to be resurrected when Christ returns. But they all died not having received the promise. You see, for the true Christian, this, is, this, this world is like an alien nation. It's one where you don't belong. We don't belong. It's not, it's not God's world. you know. And that's one of the meaning when it talks about we are pilgrims on this earth. We're just passing through. This is not our home. This is not what it's all about. We look for a better world. A world where God is king. A world where Christ is king. Lord of lords. And he rules this world with a rod of iron. That's what we're looking for. Where everything is made right. We're looking for a utopian government. Where everything is beautiful. Everything is right. So I think back to this little statement that Phil Robertson said. You know, it's your world. I'm just trying to live in it. It's not easy living in an alien nation one that has rejected God. But that's exactly where we are as a nation. We have, even with all of our religion, we're on the brink of rejecting God. And it is evident by as we choose to lose our freedom, as we choose to give up America's freedom, to give up our constitutional rights, to give up and turn to things like socialism, it's very evident that we don't value freedom very much like we used to. You know, the men that have died for our freedom, they value it. But that old, you know, that generation of sensible people are dying off. They're dying off very quickly. Um, and there's not much good to replace it with. So Matthew 6 and verse 10 says, Jesus said, When you pray, say, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. 
And it is an acknowledgement that, number one, this is not God's world. And number two, God's will is not being done here. You know, heaven doesn't need fixing. I don't know if anybody informed you of that lately, but heaven doesn't need fixing. The problems are right here on earth. And we are to pray, your will be done on this earth as it is up in heaven. Thy kingdom come. Now, I want to offer you something here, a Bible study. Uh, lesson one. This is something brand new here. It's a great Bible study entitled, What is the End of the World? You see, before Jesus returns to this earth to set up his kingdom, we're going to experience something called the end of the world or the end of the age. That is the end of the age of mankind trying to fix our problems, trying to govern ourselves without the Spirit of God. We're going to come to a point referred to as the end of the world. What is the end of the world or the end of the age? This is a great Bible study. I'll send it to you free of charge. The reason I say it's great is because it has the unique ability to ask the right question. Part of learning is asking the right questions. If you don't ask the right questions, you will never learn. And what this Bible study does is, is that it asks the right question, and then it points you to the Bible for the answer. It's an, it will be, I can guarantee you this, this will be the, the best Bible study you've ever gotten your hands on. What is the end of the world or the end of the age? And how will it happen? What are the things that you need to look to? What will occur? What did Jesus say would occur? You need this Bible study. I'll send that to you free of charge. I won't sell your name to a mailing list. I'm uh, not going to bother you or beg you about money or anything like that. Free of charge. Just write for it and I'll send it to you. Bible, uh, why study the Bible? Bible study lesson number one. What is the end of the world? Order that. And uh, I'm David Freeman with Is That Really in the Bible? And remember, Jesus said, when you pray, say, Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'll see you next time. What is the end of the world? Will God allow humanity to come to an end? What is the hope that we should have for the future? Jesus came preaching the good news about the soon coming kingdom of God. Order your free Bible study entitled, What is the End of the World? Find out what prophecy says about the times which we are now living. Learn what Jesus said we should look for at the end time. Learn what world events will be like at the end. More importantly, learn what Jesus said about the true gospel of the good news about the soon coming kingdom of God. Order your free Bible study entitled, What is the End of the World? Order by writing to Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. That's Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. Also, visit us on the web at is that really in the Bible dot net?